Now we know that the chapters and verses of the Bible were not originally in the scrolls. Man divided the chapters. But what is amazing is that in the Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet consists of 22 letters. The book of Revelation consists of 22 chapters. And every chapter of Revelation stamped in order the meaning of the Hebrew letter. It's just phenomenal. What it shows is the inspiration of the scriptures. On the left is the actual letter, the Hebrew letter. Anciently, it was written in a pictograph form, which looks kind of like a shepherd's staff, but it's upside down. And the meaning of each letter actually had a meaning. And in Hebrew letters uh, or writings, the letter Alamed meant a staff, a cattle goat, or a correcting rod to control, to prod, or urge something to drive toward or forward, something, uh, or a tongue, as in teaching or correction. So Lamed means to teach, to correct, to lead, like a shepherd leading his flock. A correcting stick, a rod. Remember we read about that Jesus would have this rod which we would rule over the nations with? In fact, we have it up here. Revelation 12, 5. She brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. This pattern is, is, is remarkable because it, so far it has fit every chapter in Revelation, and it's also fit every chapter in the Gospel of John, by the way, because John is the same author. And the, in Revelation twelve fifteen, we read the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. We said that was teaching, right? It's false teaching. The Satan has false teaching and lies. Well, this letter represents teaching as well. And in Matthew chapter 7, 26, we read, And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, and the rains descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Jesus waited false teaching with false words. First he said, those who paid attention to his words, which would be the true water of life, their house stood firm when the floods came. But then he says the ones who didn't pay attention to his word, that heard something else, their houses were crushed by the flood. So once again, we see how, the whole, how this whole chapter corresponds with this letter. We also uh, see, uh, see this in the, in the uh, Gospel of John. I said it also follows the same structure. Uh, we have some scriptures right out of chapter 12 from, from the Gospel of John. What we see here is um, Jesus is urging them to follow the voice or the tongue. Another meaning of the letter Lamed is tongue, to teach using the tongue or to correct. You know, parents don't have to whip their kids. All they, most of the time, all they have to do is correct them with words, right? And he said, Jesus is saying, follow the voice of the shepherd or the tongue of the shepherd. Um, John 12, 26 says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Uh, 12, 32, it says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. What is that? It's the shepherd, right? We're supposed to follow Jesus. Remember he said the, uh, the sheep will only hear the voice of the shepherd. If we're following another voice, we're not his, right? And what, what is the other voice? The other voice is some other thing other than the word of God. If you're, if you're going to a church and you're listening to, and the preacher's not preaching out of the book, He's not preaching the word. You're listening to something else. You know, you can only have one, two, you know, one choice. It's either, or two choices, either word, God's word or it's not. And we uh, went over the uh, versions of the translations. We, we see they're changing translations as well, but that's a whole other thing. In John chapter 12, 35, 36, it says, Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while, while it is light with you, walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walks in the darkness knows not where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may be children of the light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. What is he, what is he admonishing here? He says, 
His instruction, again, he's pointing back to his instruction. His words, the tongue, what came out of his mouth, not the serpent's mouth. As long as you have my words, do what I say while you can still do what I say. There's coming a time where you may not have that anymore. So listen to what he said. Jesus said in uh, verse 49, he said, I have, I have not spoken of myself. And I didn't make up these words. He said, the Father which sent me gave me commandment what I should say and what I should speak. Wow. In other words, the words that we have are not only Jesus' words, they're words of the Father. The Father told him what to say. And I know his commandment is life everlasting, and whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. You want to know how your judgment's going to go? When you see Christ, what, what, what's the judgment going to be like? Well, maybe he's just going to read the Word of God. And every time you're guilty, the, a buzzer will go off. I'm not really sure, but I know this. Jesus spoke the words. The Holy Spirit spoke the words. God endorses the words. So if we want to know what God's thoughts are, we got to go to the book. If we go to anything else, we're going to hear a different voice. The sign of Aries. What does Aries represent? It's interesting. The sign of Aries, according to the Greek mix, there was a ram, this ram up here, Aries. It first appears uh, in, in the mythology just before the offering of a guy by the name of Phrixus as a human sacrifice. Now, according to the story, King Athamas has sought to ward off a famine by offering uh, his son Phrixus of his first wife. His second wife convinced him that the King Zeus would consider nothing less than offering his son Phrixus. Now, obviously, that's mythology. That's not Bible. However, where does that fit in? Does that relate to anything? Remember when Abraham offered up his son Isaac? And just before God told him, offer his son, offer your son, your only son, right to me. God, he was, Abraham was going to cut his throat and offer him as a burnt offering. And then an angel grabs his hand, stops him, and says, Offer up the ram instead. This story is being echoed here with the signs in the heavens because the father was going to offer up his son Phrixus and this ram. You also have maybe heard about the golden fleece. He's the ram with the golden... He flies down. Phrixus climbs on his back. He takes off, he saves Phrixus from being offered, and then when Phrixus lands with the ram on the ground, Phrixus takes the ram in his place and offers them as a sacrifice. So you can see the parallel there. In fact, this scripture is what we just looked at here. Uh, For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, thy only son. We've said on occasion as well, the reason God can offer his son is because Abraham was willing to offer his son. And God was his covenant partner, right? But I brought this up before. Remember the fish were bound by this band. You can't hardly see it, but you can see the one fish's tail, Pisces. There's actually two fish there bound here. And here's a monster, the sea monster, Cetus. Remember we said it's the ram who breaks the band and sets those fish free? And that ram represents Christ. We actually see the, the, the full picture here in the constellations. And you can see, here's, here you can see the, the two fish Pisces. See when the ram, Aries, breaks the band, the fish are set free. Remember the scripture said, And the woman flees into the wilderness, and the child is caught up to God. You notice one, one fish is going straight up in the air, and the other one's going out. That's like the, the woman... Is, Israel is running into the wilderness while the other, the other one represents the ones being raptured into heaven. The band which ties them to the monster. This monster has multi-heads as well and he really represents the dragon or the beast which is also to come in Revelation chapter 13. But here he does represent the dragon which we see in the scripture and we spoke about spiritual warfare well, what does all this represent? Well, if we look at the Greek myths, the, this monster here represented Typhon, the fiercest monster of all, having a hundred heads. Well, of course, the dragon only has seven heads. 
But in the myth, it says it had a hundred heads, each speaking a different tongue. According to the myth, this great monster had rushed toward Olympus to destroy the kingdom of heaven. None were able to overcome the monster except the promised seed that was to come. Here's the promised seed that was to come. If you're familiar with mythology, it's Perseus. And do you know what he has in his hand? He's got the head of Medusa. But literally, what the name of the star or the name of that head is not Medusa. That's in the myth. The name is Satan. In other words, he cut off the head of Satan. What I've done is I've just moved the woman. See, the woman is bound here in chains. That represents the bride and who's bound to the monster. Here comes the hero who is the Messiah, represent the Messiah. He comes with the head of Satan that he's cut off. And this is the beast or the dragon and he slays the dragon. You could also think like this. If this is Satan, he takes his sword, chops off his head and he's got his, his head in his hand. And again, the, the star there is uh, literally Satan. We actually see the scripture here in Psalm 7, 74, 14. It says, Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. That um, uh, beast, that uh, Leviathan that it's talking about in Psalm was a representation. If you'll do a study on that, you'll find out Leviathan is a seven-headed dragon that he's talking about in the book of Psalms. Uh, Revelation 12, 14, we've already read the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly in the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So she's set free from the serpent. Um, we can read down a side here, Perseus. The Hebrew name is Peretz, meaning the breaker. The bright star in his left foot is named Athik, which means who breaks. In the Egyptian zodiac of Dendera, his name is Kar. Krem, which means he who fights and subdues. He is without a doubt the promised Messiah who must come to subdue the creature, Cetus. The star in his waist is called Murfak, which means who helps. He is the one who comes forth to assist the chain virgin Andromeda, who is about to be devoured by the great sea serpent. In his right shoulder is a star named al Ganeb, which means who carries away because he's going to carry him. Remember, he, she's carried off into heaven. Um, he carries her away for he shall carry away the virgin to a place of safety. All the while he holds in his left hand the head of Medusa. And if you check out the star, the meaning of the star, you'll find out that head means literally Satan. This woman, that the next constellation that you see, it's a glorified woman who is now, it, it sits as a queen. Well, who is this? You'll find out if you study this that the uh, this is uh, Cassiopeia, and she represents the same woman that was bound up in chains, which we call Andromeda. She's now saved, and she has a place on a throne next to uh, uh, Cepheus, which is, uh, is is the king who sits on the north northern uh, star. We saw him last week. And um, look here down the side here. In fact, we have a scripture here. Behold, from Revelation 21, 9. Behold, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And here she is, all glorious in heaven. If we read down the side here, uh, both Cassiopeia and Andromeda are called by the same name within the Egyptian zodiac of Dendera, proving that both signs are intended to represent the same woman. The Arabic name is Rukaba, and the Chaldean name is Datal Kursa. Both names mean the enthroned. The figure is that of a beautiful woman woman who sits enthroned as a queen within her hand she holds a branch of victory or triumph the star located in the top of her chair is named calf uh, which means the branch if you look through your scriptures you can see uh, many references in the old testament prophetically where it talks about the branch it represents the messiah and the ancients called her from the daughter of sp her the daughter of splendor from which she also got the nickname the glorified woman in fact the very name cassiopeia means the beautiful in throne.